We would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Kwame Ampofo, who is a private consultant. He was also the former chairman of the Energy Commission. I believe we'll be able to ask him some questions and get some insight from him as well. Coffee is still available. In case you are still hungry, you can have some coffee, even while we go into the next session. I see a lot of movement going on, and we just encourage the media to stay. All right, we'd like to call on Mr. Ben Boache from the Africa Center for Energy Policy to take us into the next session. A round of applause, please. Um, you may not have uh, a solar panel, but you, you came here by transport, so you use petroleum. Um, so I expect this conversation to be much more engaging. Uh, to do this all-important discussion, I have here, uh, with, uh, I will call to uh, the table um, Mr. Francis Perry, um, Senior Fellow, uh, OCP Policy Center. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I have Mr. Uh, Emmanuel Kuyole, uh, who is the Executive Director Center for um, Extractive Development. I also have uh, Mr. Parkwesi Anamuasachi, the Executive Director Institute of Energy Security, uh, to join us. Parkwesi, if you're here, uh, I saw you earlier, join us. And I have Dr. Ishmael Aka, and I'm excited to see that all the panel members appear. And uh, uh, we have someone from policy perspective to, to look at the broader policy issues. We have uh, someone from the development side of things to also help us diagnose what we need to do uh, on the continent. We also have somebody from the security side of things to look at energy security relative to oil and gas. And Dr. Aka, who is also with the planning ministry, will help us perhaps you know, deal more with uh, what we need to do as far as planning uh, is concerned. But like I mentioned, um, hydrocarbon may stay with us for a while as a continent. We are producing so much and consuming uh, very little. The continent has been blessed in recent times with significant discoveries, uh, particularly uh, gas. Uh, we're talking about uh, huge gas discoveries in Senegal, um, Tanzania, uh, and, and Nigeria. So how can we be part of that, uh, 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 the consumption of these uh, hydrocarbons and not just be producers and exporters uh, of hydrocarbon? What do we need to do as a continent uh, to ensure that we can increase the penetration of the use of uh, 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 hydrocarbon in our continent. So, if I may start with you, France, uh, uh, Francis. Um, from policy perspective, um, as African countries, let's uh, uh, look at, at the country level and even at the regional level, what are the specific policy um, uh, requirements to ensure that African can, Africa can grow uh, is use of hydrocarbons with um, a biomass in mind because you have, you know, countries still relying significantly on biomass, cutting down trees when we could use hydrocarbons uh, 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 to, to provide an alternative energy source uh, for our people. So what can we do from policy standpoint to ensure that we can deepen our use of hydrocarbons? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the world level, today fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal, cover about 85% of world primary energy demand. And non-fossil fuels, which means hydro, other renewable energies, and nuclear energy, about 14 to 15%. We are told that, of course, we must, uh, over the next years and decades, um, try to do what is necessary to um, increase the share of non-fossil fuels for obvious environmental and climate reasons. We all know this about. 
As far as Africa is concerned, an increase in oil and gas consumption, including also, also LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, is important for the, the region because it could contribute to displace some forms and uses of biomass which um, may present and present significant risks for the environment and for the local populations, especially uh, women and, and children. So it's a paradox of the situation. Uh, less fossil fuels at the world level, at least this is the goal, it does not mean that it will be reached uh, because, as you know, world oil consumption is increasing and world gas consumption is increasing, but it's another, it's another issue. But at the African level, especially sub-Saharan Africa, it's important that oil and gas uh, play a significant role in Africa future energy mix. As of today, Africa accounts for about 4% of world oil consumption and about 4% too of world gas consumption, which is not a great proportion. And you must also take into account that there is a great lot of concentration in this uh, uh, energy consumption. Uh, to be more specific, uh, as far as oil is concerned, if you take Egypt, uh, Algeria and South Africa and you add up the, con the consumption of these three countries, you have a little less than 50% of Africa oil consumption. And as far as gas is concerned, uh, it's even more pronounced because uh, if you take two countries, uh, Egypt and Algeria, you have about two-thirds of Africa gas consumption. There is another issue, and the, our chairman dealt with this issue in its um, uh, opening remarks. Um, Africa is very energy rich, including oil and gas. You refer to recent gas discoveries, um, to recent oil discoveries. We know that on the continent, Uganda will become in the coming years an oil producer and exporter, that Kenya will become an oil producer and exporter. We know that uh, you dealt with this issue, Mr. Chairman, Senegal and Mauritania will become gas producers and exporters and exporters of LNG, liquefied natural gas. We know that uh, Tanzania and Mozambique will become gas producers and exporters also in the form of LNG for the most part. And as far as Mozambique is concerned, it will become in the next decade one of the biggest LNG exporters in the world. Not the biggest, because you will have uh, at the head of the competition uh, three countries which are the US, uh, Qatar and Australia. But uh, Mozambique will export huge amounts of LNG in the coming, uh, the coming decade. We also have another key issue, which is the large, the wide difference between Africa oil production capacity and Africa refining capacity. Uh, as of today, um, oil production capacity in Africa is about 8 million barrels per day, more or less. It will increase, of course, but uh, these are the figures of today or in the recent years. But at the same time, Africa's refining capacity is about 3.5 million barrels per day. It has two consequences. It means that, of course, Africa has a lot of oil to export. Uh, it's, of course, good for the other countries, for the world oil market, to have this source of oil from the African continent. Uh, it's, of course, interesting for the countries concerned in terms of oil export revenues and budget revenues. But uh, there is a problem with this issue. It means that uh, African countries, many of them, go on importing significant amounts of refined products 
in order to meet their own national consumption, even if several of them have very important and sometimes huge oil resources. As far as gas is concerned, Africa is also a net exporting region because gas consumption is very weak. And there is a huge challenge in um, having some of these national capacities for, uh, regional, sorry, capacities for oil and gas to be used first for the benefits of the local uh, population. Here, the refining issue is a key issue. Um, we have to build more refineries in Africa. We have to revamp, to renovate several refineries in Africa in order for the region and the countries concerned to be able to meet local and regional demand. We spoke about Ghana, which has the ambition to become a hub for West Africa. So uh, the country wants to renovate its only refinery, the Tema refinery, and to build in the next years several refineries, of course in order first to meet a growing local consumption, but also to be able to export uh, refined products to, uh, to West Africa. So the refining issue is a key issue, but we know that economically it's not easy to be profitable in the refining business. It's not the upstream part of the oil business. And here, a key issue, Mr. Chairman, is clearly the regional dimension. We have 54 countries in Africa. It's clear that uh, on only a national basis, the private sector will not be attracted in order to build several new refineries in Africa only on a, region, a national basis. With the development and deepening of regional cooperation, of course the refining issue does not become simple, but it does become much less complex, especially in terms of profitability and financing terms. So perhaps on uh, the, this first uh, uh, speech, I will uh, stay here uh, in order not to take too much time for the other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I enjoyed listening to you and I wanted you to keep going. Uh, thank you very much. Can we clap for him uh, for his presentation? And uh, very key uh, point that we need to be able to refine um, what we are producing if we have to use it. Uh, because if you have to ship it out and bring it back, the cost can be a disincentive for uh, 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 extending the use of uh, energy uh, to our people and the regional dimension also becomes very important. I will skip you, Ima, and go to Pakwasi to tie in the infrastructure demand and what we really need to do at the regional level, at the country level, to ensure that the refining, the storage and the infrastructure that is required to ensure that we can harness and grow uh, 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 demand for energy uh, can be in place. Uh, if you can talk to us from your work and what we need to do as a continent uh, to put in place that infrastructure uh, to help us uh, uh, use energy in the continent. Thank you very much, Ben, and good afternoon to my senior citizen here. Uh, ben, I'm sure Francis has shed a lot of light on the demand globally and uh, within the regional setup, and so I won't go uh, much deep in there. But then, a research done by Ezra Mabel recently suggested that oil and gas demand is going to grow um, by at least 25% going to 2040 thereabout. And that um, if you look at today, the setup of um, the fuel mix and which one is consumed the more, you'll find that oil will come first, coal second, uh, gas will come before the rest follow. By 2040, definitely gas is going to overtake uh, coal to become a very dominant fuel and uh, penetration will be more than 50% increments oh, in consumption. Um, oil will also grow by more than 20% all that. So it means that these two products become key products for us as, um, as a continent, Africa, and knowing very well that we have abundance of these resources. But then how do we get the, the, the best out of it? I see that report. But 
almost 70% were imported. It means that um, we are just takers of this fuel. We don't let some go out. And knowing very well that we have very good um, refinery capacity within the region, if you're going to add um, Dangote very soon, you'll see that we are going to go into the region about 2 million barrels a day. That's quite huge, and it could meet our demand. However, the utilization rate is very low for sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we do between 45 to 58 percent. So it means that we need to look at, if we want to um, just get the best use of our own resources, then we need to refine more. And so we should be efficient in our refinery as well. And so that's one key infrastructure that we begin to look at if we have to get um, uh, energy security. And before I go further, energy security will not be only looking at the supply of the energy at just the, a fair price. But then for us as producers, we need to sell these products. Energy security also means for us that we are, we are going to have uh, off-takers of our own crude oil. So it is key that we look at this. And for us to get uh, adequate supply of this fuel for our own consumption and also for our off-takers, we need to have adequate uh, infrastructure. I've mentioned the refinery. We look at our pipelines as well for transportation. Within the Sub-Saharan Africa setup, it is just the oil that have, it's more transported by um, pipeline. For LPG, we have a deficit in its transportation within our corridors. Uh, for natural gas, we also have some form of uh, difficulty. And so we need to look at our pipeline. Other infrastructure that's key for our consumption as a region and also for deliveries onto the external market is electricity. You understand that um, we, are, we have deficits in this very area as well. And so to have energy security, you need to have the infrastructure in position and ensure that it will be able to supply us or receive, we're receiving the products and we're also selling the products going forward. That brings to the question of regional integration and that's where everybody, the trend has been. Today, Ghana cannot easily export to uh, Togo, neither can we easily export to Nigeria, except of course we look at ocean. But let me give you a critical, um, a typical example. Supposing um, we are refining our 10 crude here in Ghana, and Tamari Refinery is doing that. When we are done, because there is regional integration, and if it's working, we'll be able to sell it to uh, Togo. And uh, you know there are tax waivers that could come along the way for them. And so we are going to be more competitive than the importing the uh, product from Europe. However, there is no linkage between us and Togo, except by ocean or by truck. From Akosombo, or let me use the Adome Bridge, where bus has a terminal, Mame Water Depot, to Togo, the border, it's about 75 kilometers. It means that it's just like from Tema, or your refinery, to Akosombo, we can connect easily, so that when we refine, we feed Togo. Togo will also be able to feed Benin because the only linkage between Benin and the other countries is like Nigeria and Benin, where Benin feeds them more of their storage from the upper, the northern belt. So I think that storage and pipelines are very key for our regional distribution of our products. One other challenge that comes in there will be transportation, but I still come back to uh, electricity. If we have in, we, if we have it in abundance, we'll be able to power our own uh, transportation easily by rail and other modes. And so, the region we are good with the oil and gas, we have abundance, we are consuming more as a region, but it's by more of importation. And for us to have energy security, we need to build up our infrastructure well and ensure that we can easily distribute among ourselves and the leftover we export as well. Oh, thank you very much, Pakwasi. That is very insightful. The infrastructure is really critical, and we have opportunity to link uh, some of these infrastructure to ensure that we can service uh, the region. Ima, I'll come to you. As a development person, uh, we need to extend the use of um, hydrocarbon, uh, particularly if you look at the way we are cutting down trees you know, as uh, cooking fuel uh, across the continent. That is devastating for the environment. And if we have opportunity, uh, for example, with gas, uh, to extend its use to our people, how do we do that? 
how do we engineer this whole uh, uh, policy discussions and uh, conversation to ensure that we actually achieve results? Because we are told that by 2050, Africa will contribute 50% of population growth uh, in, in the world. So with this increasing population, are we going to still be using bio, uh, wood, uh, biomass or we would extend the use of hydrocarbons to, to reach this uh, uh, population? Thank you very much, um, Boshi, and uh, also thanks to Imani and OCPP for, for inviting us uh, to this rather interesting uh, <clears throat> conversation around the, 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 the energy issue and uh, integration. You know, when I, when I was uh, trying to just organize my thoughts, I, I ran into a, a document that uh, you not only had, but there's a quote in it that I thought might be interesting, um, especially since for Ghana and uh, Moroccans, uh, if you're from Morocco, you probably pardon us. We are in the, I said, a, a week of celebrating the founder or founders this sort of not too long ago. And it, it was a, a quote uh, in, in, uh, about, um, it, which is compiled by the BBC uh, concerning our first president, Nkrumah, as he was discussing the Valco and the integrated aluminum project within the, his uh, development plan. And I found it quite interesting. One professor at a Lewis asked him, or said, after he had said many things about how Valco and all the things was going to be integrated and help Ghana to leapfrog and also link to the entire uh, use of nat uh, uh, natural resources within the African continent. So Professor Atta Lewis said, as a president, this is unquote, if all these ideas you articulating are indeed translated into the development plan of Ghana, Ghana will be attempting to walk even before it has learned to crawl. Then President Nkrumah responds, who says Ghana, we want to walk? Ghana is going to fly. And I saw I, so I came in, I was listening to Bento, Bento and uh, some of the discussions. Then I asked myself, I said, well, Imani, I don't know, Franklin and the team, my question is, what makes you think that some of our current leaders now are thinking about flying? In fact, a lot of them are still stuck in the chlorine mood, or even some don't even want to walk. Because the truth of the matter is that when, when you look at the plans, even for Ghana and a lot of the, and the AU has done a lot of work on, on this subject matter. The question is, why are we stuck? And that, that's where I found this quote interesting. That a lot of our leaders are not really interested in the flying discussion. They are, interest, they are really stuck in wanting to just sit where they are in their small enclaves. We go wake up and every morning what we do is our leaders insult each other. And whilst people are thinking, you know, what we do is spend our time, that either we steal the little money that is there, and I'll show you why it's so, or we rather spend money on people to insult other people. So that's why we are where we are. Because, you see, and I'm saying this because there is an example, and as uh, Frank said, if you look at the, in, in terms of how do you really deal with this, we, we, we started for a very long time. If you look at in North Africa, especially countries like Algeria and Egypt, Egypt build the pipelines and they export gas to Lebanon, Israel, and, and so on for a very long time. But I'm interested more in Algeria because the Algerian story, it's quite similar to some of the challenges we face now at the time they did it. And this is way back 70s, by the way. When they decided that they had found enough gas and they were going to not just consume it locally, but also try to tap into the European market. And so when you look at one of the projects that the Algerians did, and there, a lot of studies have been conducted around this in terms of the lessons that this gives for us. And the other lesson for me will be our attempt to do a similar thing with the West African gas pipeline. Why have we not succeeded? The, what the Algerians did is that, and because we don't have a lot of time, I think the lesson there for me is the, the political context and the rule of 
government. I know that a lot of people will shrink, and especially the money team when I say the role of government. But you see, and when I listened, we were sitting through the financing discussion that just took place, and like it or not, where the continent is at the moment, we will need a thinking and a very careful government role to be able to solve this problem. Why? Because in the case of the Algerian, it was a very deliberate attempt. The Italians needed the gas, and they wanted to position themselves with Europe at a particular time to be able to ensure that they were gas sufficient and, you know. The Algerians were smart enough to realize that we didn't have the resource, I mean the money, but we had the resource. And we needed somebody to invest. And so they, they, they came into an arrangement that allowed the Italians, interestingly, using ENI, which was the National Oil Company, to orchestrate a process where the government provided the requisite guarantees for ENI to mobilize all the companies that he needed to mobilize for the gas pipeline to be built so that gas could be transported from Algeria through Tunisia to um, Italy. But the Algerian government did not just sit aloof. They were very strategic in ensuring that they would be able to make sure that they also supply some of the gas to meet their domestic needs. So trying to sort of kill one, uh, two beds with one stone meeting their domestic need at the same time tapping into not just the African market, but also the European market. It's interesting that when you, you, you read around this, you see that the Nigerian tried to do the same thing recently, not too long ago, where there was some conversation of getting Nigeria gas to go all the way through Algeria. But the sad thing about the African story is that since that idea was mooted a couple of years ago, that Nigerian pipeline has still not been built. The one we have tried to build is the West Africa gas pipeline. But we all know the story about the West Africa gas pipeline. The pipeline has been constructed. The government, you say that the political will was there because the, the president signed and so on. So the point I'm trying to make with all this is that the context has changed. Right now, you, and I was listening to carefully, you know, we still have, you know, take or pay, contract that we signed, but there are a lot of uh, uh, private players now in the industry. So the companies are not necessarily interested in your national energy security per se. They are more interested in their commercial interest. It is the government who is interested in a national energy security. And so our policy, the way we frame our policy and the way we implement it, it's very, very important. When I listened to the, the, the earlier conversation, I asked myself, I said, okay, so if we, if we in the 60s, 70s build schools, and go check, by the way, most of the schools that were built in the 60s, 70s, all of them had underground tanks for water storage, most of them. Most of them had, under, and this was 1960s. But in 2018, we are constructing schools in places where the uh, water company has not laid pipelines, and nobody thinks about putting water tanks there. So we finish, and then now we say there's a school, but there's no water. That's where I'm, com I'm coming from with this quote from the, the thinking, the, the thinking point. So the point I want to make is that there are a lot of challenges, but I see a lot more opportunities than challenges. If we have excess capacity and talk to a lot of private sector people in Ghana until the recent dollar issue, the number one challenge will be energy. And yet we say we have excess uh, energy capacity. We can utilize it and the private sector people are saying we don't have, we cannot afford the, the energy that we have. So I think it's really about, the, the issue about Africa is that our leaders, when it comes to the energy situation, like many other things, are thinking more about how much revenue this is going to generate in the short term for us. So it's more about export. They are more export-oriented in their thinking and getting the immediate 
retain than to do the hard work of putting in place the infrastructure and having the patience to making sure that we can provide this energy source for a lot of okay. our people. To I, will, I will come back to you for us to try and hack this crawling business. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real problem and I, I can see even from what is happening uh, in Ghana and attest to that. I mean, uh, from the, uh, the Algerian example where they linked local consumption with export, which was really significant in ensuring that there was uh, a local use of their gas. And compare that to what is happening in Ghana. Um, it was a, a fantastic idea to produce our gas and ship it onshore uh, so that we can consume the gas locally. But look at what has happened. You have ENI and its partners investing seven billion dollars to build all the infrastructure uh, offshore and our preparation to just build a pipeline to consume the gas we have been sleeping over it and now we have the gas delivered and nothing ready to consume the gas you know so it comes back to the same point about leadership and how we crawl uh, 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 in ensuring that what we walk the talk um, but I'll go to Ishmael and I, 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 I'll come back for a deeper conversation on this. Ishmael, from planning perspective, <laughs> you are the, the man in charge of planning, so let us know. From planning perspective, what can we correct to ensure that the issues that have been mentioned, the infrastructure that we need to build, uh, and even maintaining the infrastructure and its use, we are told that the 600 kilometer pipeline that was built between Ghana uh, and Nigeria is almost redundant. What are the political hurdles that we need to scale uh, to ensure that the plan can be rolled out and implemented as efficient as was thought uh, through? And also link that to the, 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 the region as a whole. Do we still have potential to extend the pipelines? For example, we have gas coming up, uh, uh, more gas coming up in Senegal. Can that also be fed into the regional arrangement uh, for us to consume? Or that could also become another white elephant. What do we need to do from planning perspective? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Imani. I think uh, since I retired, this is the first time I've gotten an opportunity like this to speak. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting topic. We look at oil and gas in terms of production Africa is contributing about 7.5% of global production, but consuming less than 5%, as the first speaker said. Now, before I even come to, or before I start, I think that we have to make a choice. And when you make that choice, you decide to put in measures to achieve that choice. We have the potential, oil and gas resources, First, do we produce the oil and gas, export, get the money, and use the money to do investment, as most countries are doing? Or do we refine the oil and gas here and export the product, the finished product, so that at least we create jobs, we add value, and all those things? Or we refine locally, and we use the oil and gas for our power and other local consumption. So these are three choices. Now all these choices have consequences. So first, yes, we have the potential which we've identified. Then we have to make a choice. A spot, refine and a spot, or refine and use locally. But all these have consequences. First, whatever we're going to take will depend on the nature of contract we even sign. So if you sign a contract, that I'm going to produce gas locally. But the nature of the contract is such a way that the gas I'm going to export from another country will be cheaper than the gas I'm going to produce locally. Then it doesn't make economic sense to refine and use it locally. That's the first one. Then there's also the issue of infrastructure, the pipelines. I mean, gas pipelines normally thrive on long-term contracts and demand. <laughs> So first, we have to establish the fact that, yes, there's demand, and two, we sign the contract. But the signing of the contract and the building of the infrastructure is one thing. 
The contract, the pipeline is going to deliver natural gas, which should be paid for. So when you take the West African gas pipeline, there are two issues we are dealing with. Yes, Nigeria has not been maybe reliable, first because they also have their local demand to meet. But Ghana has also not been reliable in terms of paying for the gas we get. So we, we cannot blame, for instance, Nigeria. We have to look at the fact that gas is not free and we have to pay for it. So it requires a lot of money to invest in pipelines, to invest in regasification projects and all that. But first there should be demand and we should be prepared to pay for the gas we receive. Then there's also the issue of self-discipline. I mean, toll was not like this in the 70s, in the 80s. We had a plant refining, making, breaking even, making profit. By the time came, the government can order a power company, a government power company, to go to toll, take oil, we'll pay. The power company will produce the power. Another government company will take the power, sell it. Will not pay the power producer, the power producer will not pay at all, and will become a government affairs. So by 2003, 2004, the debt was so much to the extent that we had to introduce a debt a recovery levy to pay for all this debt. So if we are, we are not seeing power as a, an economic good which we should consume and pay, then some of these issues, we can build the infrastructure, we can look for the funding and all that. But we will not be able to pay and, I mean, the investment. Then we should also look at the tariff system. I mean, look at our, our system in Africa, where in Ghana, for instance, the residential sector is paying less than the industrial sector. I mean, we are taking our power tariff system from the structural adjustment program where power is seen as a social good, a poverty alleviation tool. And for that matter, if we're able to give 50 kilowatt per hour to somebody, we count it at access. So you go to Ghana, is 85%. You go here, it is maybe that person, that household is just consuming 50 kilowatt per hour. Now that 50 kilowatt per hour, which may be the average, annual average, is the total consumption of a US citizen for just 33 hours. Now, what can that do? So we have to also look at a tariff system that encourages the use of power for productive purposes. When industry uses power because they are using it to generate income, they're able to pay. And they can pay the tariff and all those things, and this can also encourage investment. So for me, I think that, yes, let's make a choice. See power as an economic good. And if we are making a choice to refine and use our oil and gas locally, then we should put in the measures. For instance, my brother spoke about the regional integration, which is also very good. Unfortunately, at times, how we understand the regional integration is that let's have a West African power pool, let's have the East African power pool. Then we consume from a producer. No. The power pool should be in such a way that we can also collectively invest. So Ghana, Nigeria can invest in a pipeline. Ghana, Liberia can invest in a gas project. Now when it comes, unfortunately one of the indicators or one of the very good factors to ensure a successful power pool is unbundling the distribution and the generation bit. Most of the Francophone countries are not unbundling. So you go to Cote d'Ivoire, there is one company from generation through transmission to distribution. How do we make this successful so that at least we can be on a level playing field? So there is a lot to do at the regional level. We have the target, AU Agenda 2063, the Africa Power Vision and all those things, but there's a more to be done. Let's talk in okay. more action and attention. Thank you very much, Ishmael. And uh, can we give a clap offering to all of them? And, um, I will come back to my panel, but I want to also hear from you, and not just questions, because I know there are experts uh, amongst you. I want to understand, you know, with your policy hat on, what do we need to do, those of you coming from a village like myself, uh, to send LPG to that village, uh, to ensure that they can transition uh, from wood fuel 
uh, to hydrocarbons, which has been established here, that we have abundance of. So let us get into that conversation to give us practical uh, thoughts about what you think can be done uh, to deepen the use uh, of hydrocarbons as alternative uh, to wood fuel, so that we can engage uh, uh, at that level of policy to say that this is what the practical solutions uh, uh, and this is what the public is also prescribing uh, for us to be able to uh, uh, solve our problems as far as uh, 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 use of hydrocarbon is concerned. So uh, Stephen will help me uh, to, if you raise your hand, we'll come to you and you can contribute or ask a question. So I have five yeah, minutes, and uh, I have five minutes to do this. And please be snappy, very concise, and straight to the point. I can take five people. So I have one at the back, and Nana is here. Two, and I have three. And uh, who else? The two of you combine your thoughts, and I'll, I'll pick yours from that side. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just quickly then, we've spoken a lot about... Sorry, my name is Martin Hiles. I've been in distribution of all sorts of things in West Africa for 25 years. We've spoken a lot about increasing production and creating new demand for power and how we can finance it. We haven't spoken about how to save what we've already got. We... We don't pay for electricity. The, the collapse or the, one of the biggest problems with VRA is that people haven't been paying for electricity, whether they're state institutions or private individuals that steal from ECG. We have the premix fuel system, which doesn't get down, cost Ghana $55 million a year. It doesn't get to the fishermen. Some does, but not a lot. These are where we can actually save money by paying for what we use, let's not steal it, let's use what we've got efficiently and we've already seen the success of from going from incandescent bulbs to other bulbs. Let's continue with saving what we've got before we plan on new, which we've heard a lot about today is quite difficult. Also in transport, the cheapest way to transport anything uh, liquid, that is, is by pipeline, then by water, then by rail, then by road. Ghana has a pipeline from the coast to the Burkinabi border. It was given to Ghana, the northern section, in 2008 and has never been used. We have a pipeline from the coast to the Volta Lake. It was broken, coincidentally, in 2008. It has six pinpoint breakages in it where it was drilled into. Yes, I like that point that we should uh, save what we have. And that is quite significant for me. In Ghana, when you pump uh, petrol from uh, Tema to Akosombo, it will not get there. But if you pump water, it will go. You know, so we have to think about that and save what we have, and ensure that we are not stealing it. Uh, can we get another point? Um, Ben, who are you doing next? Um, Nana was next. Nana was next? Yes. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been observing things, but it looks like uh, the members of the National uh, Planning uh, Committee have not been here. I don't know how such discussions are communicated to them. I think in the very near future, I would suggest that those who plan for this country must be key players in some of these programs. Then to, to add to infrastructural development towards the application use of these things, I think education counts a lot. At what level of our educational system do we make these uh, policies, programs, and technicalities known to the ordinary Ghanaian? Because me, as a village chief, if I want to go to my, my place and uh, implement uh, uh, renewable energy for my people, how do I go about it? What I'm seeing here is that when we talk of IPP, we are thinking of big, big, giant companies 
that will handle monies, some coming from IFCs and the rest. But a small village with about uh, uh, 1,000 citizens, how do we go about it? How do we learn? How do we educate the people? I think these are areas I wish you take a look at. Well, I'm, I'm really enjoying the contributions that are coming in. Uh, you know, educating our people to understand, not just thinking about the policy, but how do people get to know what policy is in place, uh, what is it about renewable or uh, petroleum we are talking about. So, who was the third? So, the two people that have combined their thoughts. And <laughs> yes, my question is in relation to uptake of LPG for cooking. Right, there's been a lot of research trying to find out what drives people to actually accept and use LPG for cooking purposes. And the challenge is that obviously from the literature, um, the so-called the, the income hypothesis where you think that when people become rich, then they kind to tend to move away from the wood for wells to clean fuels such as LPG and electricity. Well, I consider most of us here to be in that bracket. Can you ask yourself whether you still use charcoal or not? If you still use charcoal at home for specific purposes, why is that the case? And then we can think about people in the rural areas. How do we get people in the rural areas to move from charcoal for your wood to LPG for cooking? We know the health benefits for doing that. We know the employment benefit for doing that because you don't get too much tired using the charcoal or going to fetch for your wood and all that, that you can use the time for productive purposes. What policy can be implemented to move people from such to LPG? Given that you want to use LPG, it comes with a lot of uh, uh, equipment that should be consistent with the use of the LPG. It's not just the canisters. So if, if you subsidize the fuel itself, how are they going to get the stoves and others requirements that are necessary for the uptake of the LPG? So the policy have to go beyond subsidy. That was a combined thought? Yeah, okay. the, com the combined question and thoughts. <laughs> um, so can we pick a... Uh... Yes. Um, my name is Michael Bozombo Petruso. Um, I think what we have to understand is this. There seems to be a disconnect between the policy makers and the private sector. And if we can fix this, because we tend to think that some of these issues are so grandiose, so big, they are unachievable. But to us in the private sector, they don't mean anything. But you don't, the, the you know, policy makers don't seem to have confidence in the private sector, especially the indigenous private sector. If you take the oil and gas sector, the moment Tor went into financial difficulties, it had to take indigenous players to step in to save this country from crisis. In fact, some years ago, certain villages did not have filling stations. It had to take indigenous Ghanaian private people you hardly hear of, you know, some communities not having fuel stations. It didn't take foreign money. It took indigenous people to save. So let's believe in the Ghanaian expertise and some of these problems we can address them internally. Thank you. Uh, you know, so I'll come back to the panel uh, to wrap up for me. Um, let us now come to the solutions. Um, how do we ensure? We have talked about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the, the fact that we have the volumes. We have the hydrocarbons. What practically do we need to do? Maybe one solution that can really uh, be helpful uh, for us to ensure that we are not only producing to export, but we are actually uh, uh, engaged in the consumption uh, of, of, of hydrocarbons. So I'll start with you, Francis. And you wrap up with your final thoughts and then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, some key issues, it will not be exhaustive, of course, because of time and the other speakers will uh, go back on this. Um, oil products prices and the issue of subsidies. We know that there is a significant gap 
in, uh, on the African continent in terms of refining capacity. And of course, some of the difficulties in the refining uh, sector are directly linked to this key issue of product, oil product prices, uh, which are heavily subsidized and which, of course, has an impact on the profitability of uh, some of the refining projects uh, which have been uh, considered for sometimes a uh, very long time. Um, another uh, key issue is uh, gas flaring. We repeatedly said, and it's true, Africa is energy rich. Renewables, oil, gas, hydro, etc. As far as gas is concerned, um, we have yet a lot of gas being flared. Uh, when you have um, fields which produce both oil and gas, and you do not have an interesting market for gas, the oil companies will produce oil and flare gas, which is, of course, a huge issue. It's a very important economic loss. It's a contribution to um, atmospheric pollution. It's a contribution, of course, to uh, climate change uh, through methane, which is the main component of natural gas. Um, we also have the issue of regional cooperation. We, we dealt with, so just to, to put it on the table at the, the end of this, um, this session. And we also have um, three key issues. Uh, you need a mid-term and long-term political and economic vision. Otherwise, you will never be able in the energy field to do something which is significant. Uh, it's not a short-term sector energy, certainly not, due to the, the weight of investment and the delays construction and uh, operation delays. You also need a very strong and lasting political willingness. Strong and lasting. Not strong and not lasting. Of course, it will not be enough. And you also need trust. And um, sometimes in some regions which are very energy rich, you have more energy resources than trust, which is a problem. Energy is strategic, highly strategic. It has been said since the beginning of our seminar. And when something is strategic, it means that if you do not trust other countries, you will not cooperate with them because it's too important. And so energy cooperation, energy integration, goes back to some basic political issues, including trust at a regional, sub-regional, and continental level. Thank you. Um, I, I think a lot of the resolutions have been professed uh, uh, already, and so I'll just reiterate them and, and to say that yeah, the, the point about the, the, the policy disconnect is a very key one. But um, my view is that th there is a reason also for that. And part of the challenge we have, and I guess maybe uh, as uh, Frank already said, we are dealing with a sector that you, know, you cannot afford to be doing short-term thinking. It has to be long-term. But here we have a situation where our political leadership, unfortunately the system we are at doesn't allow them to do long-term thinking. They do short-term, four-year thinking. And so that's also partly the problem. So they are motivated about what will 2020 count for me. But that's not how you are going to achieve the objectives we are talking about here in the oil and gas sector. It's more, they are more beyond four years. And so that, that's something we need to find a way around. In addition to that, I think uh, since uh, Kofi said, you know, we have a lot of policies and legal infrastructure, I leave that. But there are market issues, the markets are different between the matured uh, markets and then the immature markets that we particularly find ourselves in in Africa. There are also issues about the power sector policies themselves, a lot of inconsistencies, and I think uh, um, 
Ishmael mentioned some of them if you compare the different countries. Then you are also financing cross-border projects uh, have their own complexities mm -hmm. because you've got to deal with different laws, regulations, you know, uh, supplier transit issues and all those kinds of things, uh, you know, different conditions for off-takers and all those kinds of things. How do you deal with that? There are also issues about vulnerability because of the particularly the geopolitical context within Africa where there are conflicts in other countries and all those kinds of things. So it, it, it's about really thinking, thinking. But unfortunately, I have to say this, this is an energy discussion, but I think that a lot of the problems which energy is one that we are faced with at the moment, we have to rethink the political structure that we have. It is not allowing the political leadership to think and to think long term. So that is what is creating a lot of the problems that we are having. It's not just a problem with Ghana, by the way. It's a problem even as we democratize. We are democratizing and we have a system where the leadership is thinking only the next election. It is the citizens who are thinking medium to long term. But the leadership is thinking four years. And so you, they can't think and plan uh, very well. And until we unravel that, we will be going, unfortunately, in these circles. All right, Ben, I, I will push for the regional integration and, um, so that we can reinforce our infrastructure base and ensure that we have adequate supply uh, within our own region before we look outside. Um, it's important that we go back to the table. I am sure on regional base, um, we've done a lot of discussion among ourselves. My senior mentioned a pipeline that lies um, at Bope to Bogatanga, lying fallow for years. There was a discussion between the Burkina Bays and Ghanaians somewhere in 2017, thereabouts. That's why they constructed the pipeline from Bope to Bogatanga, and there's a depot for over four years, it's not been used. Over more than, let's say two years, it's not been used. It's supposed to be connected to um, Wagadugu at Waga. They've not initiated that very activity. I think we need to look at it. We also need to look at our strength uh, as countries around the region. If you look at Togo, they might not produce oil, but they offer the best place for vessels to berth. Quite a security for them at the Lume Triangle. It is safe. If this is their strength, on regional base, we know that all our vessels, the bulky ones, are coming to berth here. When we go to Nigeria, we can speak of uh, the uh, refineries set up as well. While Dangote is coming on stream. We shouldn't rush as a country here to even build extra refineries because what Dangote is going to do in the next few years, the capacity of Nigeria alone is more than 1.1 .1, um, million barrels per day. So let's look at our strength. When it comes to Ghana, we have enough storage such that we cannot even turn it over quickly. It's at a cost. Mami Water Depot by Adomi Bridge has been sitting there for more than six years, it's not being used. A crab plains depot is not being used uh, efficiently. So let's look at our strength and see Nigeria refines more, we can store more. Uh, Togo uh, presents a security zone for us as a region. Then we can create the hub that we see in Arab, Antwerp, and uh, Rotterdam. Okay, thank you. So, Ishmael, mm -hmm. your thank, final thoughts. Thank you very much. So, well, I believe that um, energy access should be a priority for. African government. I mean, energy promote development, energy leads to so many other things to open the sector. Most governments, when you look at their, how they spend their oil revenues, like Ghana, Nigeria, they have priority areas, and energy access can be one, and they can invest. And for instance, they can also channel their natural gas into, into that. Another thing, too, is that I would differ a little bit from what uh, Uncle Ima said, that we are, we are thinking, in fact, in 1995, we did the vision 2020. We projected that by 2020, we're going to have 10% renewable energy access in our mix. In 2006, we did the SNAP document, Energy Commission, 10% renewable energy. AU Agenda 2063, we are thinking, the weakness is that our thinking is normally not backed by 
a very competent economic analysis. So you, 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 let's call it wishful thinking. <laughs> so you don't do the analysis, that's one. And another weakness is that we don't act. So yes, we have all the documents, we have all the dreams, we have all the visions, but we don't push forward. As Ben said, we knew that ENI was going to produce gas. Even the major infrastructure, they are doing it. When we started talking about reverse flow, <laughs> I think I was in GSS 1 or so. <laughs> and we are still talking and thinking about reverse flow. So yes, we are thinking, but we are not acting. The final one is that I think we should also be looking at creating what we call prosumers. Making the consumers also invest in energy. That's where they have net meters. In Africa, it is estimated that our consumers spend about $6.5 billion on inefficient lighting systems. How do we have net meters? So at the excess energy they consume, they can even sell it to the grid or to the power consumer. That will even create efficiency. So that I know that, yes, I have 100. When I consume 50, I can give the other 50 to ECG and get money. People will not consume more. Can we do that? The last one is, again, the upgrade solution. We cannot have all our systems on the grid. It's very expensive. So some of the places, energy access, can we look at upgrade solutions, efficient and competent ones so that we can deal with some of our challenges? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Can we give a, a round of applause to uh, my panelists? I think um, we don't have the time to exhaust all the issues, but what we have is quite significant for us to understand that as a continent we have the resources. We are into the future going to produce more oil, more gas. That presents an opportunity for us to be part of the consumption and not just export for uh, 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 the sake of revenue, uh, which we have done uh, for so long. Policy needs to be in place to ensure that we are also extending the use of uh, hydrocarbon. And also we are not just thinking, but thinking deeper enough to be able to ensure that that thought process is also backed uh, by action, uh, you know, which is often uh, lacking. And let us also allow the next political uh, party to come also continue we can't think for uh, the rest of the country in four years, <laughs> you know, so think what is feasible, think what you can do, and what is important to deliver within a short to medium term, and then allow a proper plan to continue with other, you know, elected bodies also continue with the development, and that's a problem. So you are elected for four years, and you are spending time to clean the waste of one, and you are creating more waste, <laughs> you know, so... That has been a problem because you come in and there is waste for you to, cl to clear and you're also creating more waste. So we don't have time to really do what is needful uh, for our people within the short space of four years that we have. So planning is very important. At the regional level, planning infrastructure, it has to be a well thought through process. If you build a, a pipeline, can we limit the politics so that the private sector can take over and run it more efficiently? I'm sure if we had handed the pipeline to the private sector to deal with it, run it to Burkina, they would be doing it by now. But because government is deeply involved, they don't care whether it, it rusts or not. You know, and it's not going to happen because somebody is also making money, you know, cutting it by road. And that's where his benefits are. And I think if we can limit the politics and just come out clearly that it's, it's, it's a real challenge for us uh, uh, as a continent. And the planning regionally is also something we have to address and work on. You have Ghana saying it wants to be a, a hub uh, for the West Africa region. And Nigeria is investing billions, developing the same infrastructure. And you have um, Senegal now with significant volumes of gas so close to Europe, saying that they also want to be uh, the gas hub. So who is planning, <laughs> really? Because you cannot sit here and plan to use your hub to serve anybody when they are also building their own infrastructure. And I think that level of thinking and looking at what others are doing is quite important for us to be able to uh, uh, draw the synergies and see who can better do what. So that as a continent we are developing. Because if you build the infrastructure, there's no use. It's debt on your people. And we would have to 
uh, pay uh, uh, ultimately. And I see that happening. When the power uh, problems in Ghana you know, was at, it, at its peak, you heard politicians saying we are going to export power to Benin, we are exporting power to Togo, we are exporting power to Cote d'Ivoire. At the same time, Benin also commissioned the construction of a power plant to say that Ghana has problems, so we want to uh, build power plant to go and help them. You know, so we are not planning, we are not thinking through our issues as a continent or as a region. And that is where we need to go. We need a stronger uh, bodies, regional and sub-regional bodies, to think through some of the integration processes so that uh, the isolation can be uh, limited to ensure that we have a coherent uh, plan. And I'm so grateful uh, to you all for your uh, audience and uh, my uh, uh, panelists who have been extremely fantastic in dealing uh, with the issue. So thank you very much uh, uh, for being with us for, throughout this session.